Welcome everyone to the Tenement Museum's book talk this evening, featuring Andrew Dulcart, author of Biography of a Tenement House in New York City and Architectural History of 97 Orchard Street. I'm Dave Favaloro. There it is, there's the book. <laughs> Thanks for holding that up. I'm Dave Favaloro, Director of Curatorial Affairs, and I'm glad to be with you virtually this evening. Thanks for tuning in. Before we get started, if you're watching this event live, you can ask questions and add comments for our participants throughout the event, and we'll have dedicated time at the end, of course, for answering all of your questions, uh, but feel free to, to pose them uh, throughout. If you're not familiar with the Tenement Museum, we're a museum that tells the stories of immigrants, migrants, and refugees in the United States, and we're a history museum located in New York's Lower East Side. Uh, we find our foundation in stories and storytelling, particularly those of ordinary New Yorkers and ordinary Americans, and specifically, I think really important for our conversation and our topic this evening, uh, those who lived in a pair of tenement buildings on Orchard Street, uh, where we, I think, have the opportunity to explore the ways in which those folks have shaped and can continue to shape our city and our, our country. Uh, one of those tenements, 97 Orchard Street, uh, is the subject of Professor Joel Cart's book and, and much of his scholarship. Uh, I wanna note that biography of a tenement house is available for sale via the Tenement Museum's online shop and a link uh, for you to find that shop to buy the book if you're interested uh, will be um, shared in the chat uh, for that purpose. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker this evening, Andrew Dolcard. So uh, a formal introduction, uh, Professor Andrew Dolcard is a graduate of Colgate University and Columbia's Historic Preservation Program. He has been active in historic preservation in New York City for over 30 years as a staff member uh, at the Landmark Preservation Commission, as a freelance consultant, and as a teacher. He has worked extensively with neighborhood groups on preservation efforts and has completed scores of National Register nominations, Landmark Commission designation reports, historic resource surveys for environmental reviews, and urban cultural resource inventories. Uh, he has also written extensively about the architecture and development of New York City, focusing in particular on the city's everyday vernacular building types and how they influence the character of, uh, of the city's many neighborhoods. Uh, he's written you know, more books than we probably have time to list here, but we'll name a few, of course, um, Biography of a Tenement House in New York City and Architectural History of 97 Orchard Street. Uh, before that, Morningside Heights, the history of architecture and development uh, and more recently, that Row House Reborn uh, Architecture and Neighborhoods in New York City, 1908 to 1929. So welcome, Andrew. Thanks for joining us this evening. It's a pleasure to talk about the Tenement Museum. Uh, yes. <laughs> one of my favorite places. Well, you're one of our favorite people. So this is, um, uh, you know, sure, we'll have lots to, uh, to get into. And I'm particularly interested in hearing about some of your, um, uh, some of your work over the years. Uh, about 97 Orchard Street, about the museum and, and, and the Lower East Side uh, more generally. And I think, you know, we gave folks a little bit of a, um, a synopsis of your, your sort of work in the, uh, the introduction that I just read, the bio I just read. But, you know, curious, to, you know, if you could tell us a little bit more about yourself and your work as an architectural story and historic preservationist, you know, what drew you to that field of study? Uh, what kinds of projects have you worked on? You know, give people a sense, our viewers, a sense of, um, of your work overall and, 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 and why you're passionate about it? Well, I have, I have a passion for the built world um, because I think that buildings are uh, an amazing entree into an understanding of diverse cultural issues. That if you can read buildings, if you can read, I like to say reading the built environment, you can understand so much about uh, where we are where we were as a city, uh, as, as a country. Uh, I got involved, interested in architectural history uh, and I was gonna go the usual academic PhD route, but I, 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 I dropped that because I wanted to use architectural history to bring the city alive for people. I wanted to make a, um, try to make a contribution to people and people's lives. So I went, and I transferred to the preservation program at Columbia, uh, and and uh, that was the the best thing that that 
that I ever did because it's really gotten allowed me to work uh, with communities, with uh, organizations to bring the architecture of the city uh, alive. Uh, and that's really what I, what I love to do. And before I uh, took the job as a full, full-time professor at Columbia, uh, I, I worked, uh, I, did a, I had a consulting business and I worked for a lot of groups. Um, and as it happens, one of them was the Tenement Museum. Yeah, so that's a that's a great a great segue, and you know I think um, you know it's a story I'm familiar with, but but I thought um, you know it was one that would be wonderful for our viewers to hear this evening, and and wanted um, uh, if you could share you know that that um, uh, that first introduction to the Tenement Museum. How did you become involved with the museum? What was that like for you? And and I think more importantly, how was that as you're suggesting really shaped your uh, your career and your sort of work? Well, it it did. It really did. The Tenement Museum really had an enormous influence on, on me and on what I'm interested in and my understanding of, of the city. It was um, 1988 when I got a call from Anita Jacobson and Anita along with Ruth Abram were the people who came up with the idea that we needed a tenement museum, that there were so many house museums in America and they either celebrated the very famous, the, the architecturally distinguished or the very wealthy, but that was not the history of most people's families and backgrounds. And that wouldn't it be great to have a tenement museum that celebrated the immigrant experience in particular. Uh, and so one day in 1988, Anita Jacobson called me up and said that, uh, explained what this new organization was about. And she said they were looking for a building and they thought they had found a building uh, at 97 Orchard Street where the owner was willing to lease them some space. And would I come down and take a look at it and maybe they could commission me to write a little history of it. And I have to say at that time, I couldn't have been more bored with the idea <laughs> of going to a tenement. Like, you know, why would I wanna go and, and do that? But of course, when you do work freelance, you know, you didn't say no. Sure. Um, so I, I went down and I met with uh, Ruth and Anita, and we went inside 97 Orchard Street, and it was one of the most powerful experiences of my life. It standing in one of the vacant apartments that was kind of crumbling uh, was just changed the way I looked at the city. It was such a, so powerful. A whole a whole life uh, was 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 there, and you know, part of my heritage and other people's heritages, just like Ruth. Uh, had had said that you know so many of us don't trace our our heritage to a Vanderbilt mansion, but we probably do to a tenement. And it was an extraordinary experience standing there and bringing one's own thoughts um, to it. And then I so I of course immediately said yes, I would love to do the research, and I plunged in. And I think what was interesting is there had been significant research done on the broad scope of tenement history on the 1901 Tenement House Act and other tenement house laws um, and, and the shapes of buildings, but nobody had actually looked at how that impacted on the individual building and on the lives of the people that lived in that building. Uh, and, and so that's what I set off to do, uh, was kind of turn the research that had already been done inside out so that and so, and I see the study of 97 Orchard Street as a kind of microcosm of the history of so many other buildings. You know, each one of course had its unique history because individuals and families are unique, but the, the broad scope of the ideas that, that came out from the study of 97 Orchard Street, I think are relevant to the vast sea of tenements in New York City, not only on the Lower East Side, but in, in Hell's Kitchen, in Yorkville, in, and also uh, to, to uh, the, the, the tenement housing of immigrants in other cities as well. Right. Yeah, no, I think you captured that really nicely, right? There's something to be learned uh, from this micro level study of a particular building that you can't learn uh, any other way. And it just so happened that this opportunity arose 
uh, where a museum wanted you to do this work. And, you know, I'm curious if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, this is really sort of something I think that runs throughout your book. Um, and certainly some of the work that we do rely a lot on, on that, you know, initial work that you do and, and, and the way it's been shaped over the years into uh, the various editions of Biography of a Tenement. But, you know, what, can you articulate, like, what, what is that something that we've learned by, that you've learned by studying this one particular building that you couldn't learn by all of those sort of larger macro level studies of tenement housing laws of, you know, um, any of those other various topics that intersect? Well, I think that, you know, in, in a sense, because 97 Orchard Street had been abandoned in the 1930s, with the exception of the stores, it basically had been closed up and left alone. So it was something of an archaeological dig uh, there. And so we, we knew, for, you know, you knew, one knew, for example, that a law had been passed in 1901 that mandated uh, one toilet in the hall for every two families. But what did that mean? How was that toilet inserted in a building? What did it mean to people's lives to have that? How, how did people decorate their buildings? You know, the, the stereotype is Lower East Side, land of poverty, and you know, all, right. all of these incredibly poor people and exemplified by Jacob Reese's photos. But one thing I began to, to understand as I looked at the paint layers the, and the wallpapers and the linoleum floors and the other finishes is that Jacob Reese set out to photograph the absolute worst that he could find, not the average way that people lived. Um, and, and, you know, the, the apartments were small, the buildings became run down, but it was home to people. And people made it as beautiful as they could, as they could afford to. And you know, I, and I likened it to my experience when I was in graduate school. I lived on 109th Street uh, in a, in a, a new law tenement, uh, and the walls were pretty dirty. Uh, and you know, I hung burlap on the living room walls uh, to make it look better. And you know, if there was a stain on the wall, you hung a picture uh, over it. Well, they did the same thing. Um, uh, and you know, if the linoleum got worn out, well, they got another piece and they patched it, even if it was a different pattern. Uh, and so understanding the, the actual way people lived, not just the big picture of the laws, but bringing it down to a human level, I, I think is what, what makes the Tenement Museum and what made my study of the Tenement Museum so compelling. Yeah, that's great. I mean, there are sort of countless examples, I think, of that throughout the building from all the various sort of finishes to the to really sort of small um, things that folks who call the building home um, left but behind. And one other thing that I want to add that we yeah, know was please. really, really telling is, you know, the building changed over time with new laws came in and the landlord was forced to make changes, so they did. And they, they always made those changes as inexpensively as possible. Uh, and I think one of the most interesting things was when they had to put in water. So there are the, right. there are, are the, the stone sinks uh, that were put in. And on those stone sinks, there is a little label that tells you that it was manufactured by the Alberine Stone Company of Virginia. Well, that was interesting, you know, learning the name of the company that made it. Well, then I found a trade catalog for the Alberine Stone Company. And sure enough, this was the absolute cheapest sink they sold. Uh, and you know, and it, it, it expressed the way you made changes, but there wasn't a lot of, of money to you know, put in luxurious stuff. So they did it in the most modest way that they could. Yeah, that's, that's you know, one of, one of um, you know, several examples, I think. And one of the things that I think has really fascinated me and, and, and love to hear you know, your thoughts on the subject and something I'll, of course, explore in the book as well, is all of the um, alterations made by owners of the building, landlords of the building, not when their hand was necessarily forced by the law, by regulatory changes, et cetera, uh, but, by, but for other reasons, right? And you have a really sort of interesting perspective on why some of those things might have been done. So some of the changes were made because they were required by law. 
particularly the 1901 Tenement House Act, which was the first law that required that changes be made to pre-existing buildings, and thus the toilets and the skylight uh, and other things. But to our surprise, uh, the, the, um, there were original features that were not required by law, that were later required, but, but the, the owner of the Tenement Museum had already done them, like putting in um, windows between some of the rooms. Uh, and other changes were made because a, 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 an owner wanted to keep the building fully leased because tenements were, um, uh, they, 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 the owner made a, a substantial income from the rent. And it was a very, very competitive market. And as newer buildings were being built, they had to add amenities uh, to, to their building in order to keep people because you know somebody could just get up and move to a newer building. Uh, and so it was really important to, to uh, constantly be adding some modern conveniences. That's not to say that there were newer buildings that were more up to date, but the rent might also have been a little higher. Uh, in those, but it was really important to keep up in order to keep the building fully rented. Right, that goes in some ways to what you were suggesting earlier. It helps kind of complicate this popular image of um, of tenement housing, of tenement living uh, as one ho wholly and consistently of dire poverty, uh, of um, you know really really uh, terrible living conditions, and that's not to um, that's not to suggest it wasn't. Um, difficult for many of many of the residents of 97 Orchard Street and buildings like it, right? But that this is but, but who you know, something have, that helps. Who would have guessed that in you know when, when our start with our stereotype of tenement right. uh, and tenement apartments? Who would have guessed that in the living room of one of the apartments there are like almost there are something like 25 layers of wallpaper right. that people were constantly putting in new wallpapers, uh, and some of them were inexpensive wallpapers, but according to a wallpaper historian, some of them were a little bit more expensive and maybe they were remnants, uh, but people were making these as beautiful as possible. Right, right. right. Yeah, um, you know, I think there, there are sort of countless examples of that, right? And it, it, it speaks to, I think, the expectations of um, immigrants and their children and the expectations they had for, for, as you were suggesting earlier, not only the changes they would make in their own homes to make them more livable, more beautiful, uh, et cetera, but the ways in which they had certain expectations for new wallpaper or a new coat of paint or certain kind of color schemes that might've been fashionable at the time or you know, anything of that nature that they were aware, in other words, of you know, quote unquote middle-class standards of parlor making and things of this nature. And those were incorporated perhaps in an inexpensive way, but you know, done in, in, in various ways either by themselves or the owners then nevertheless. And I think it's really important to remember that they're learning American ways. Um, and, and so, you know, wallpaper was a popular middle class item in, in, in American homes. They, 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 they may, these tenements may have been very crowded uh, and people may have worked enormously long hours, but in comparison to the hovels that they, that they might have been living in, in in Russia or Poland or Galicia, um, you know, this this was a, a, was 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 much much better. And I've been thinking a lot about this combination of the contrast between living conditions for a lot of of, of the the poor immigrants uh, in 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 Eastern Europe versus in New York, uh, mm -hmm. and and the fact that they were also so much from American middle class. Um, uh, lifestyles, you know, the that so. Uh, uh, this is not me speaking. This is other historians who have researched, right. for example, the huge number of pianos in tenement apartments. That you know right. that that learning music was a, a, a new thing that that they could do in America. And something like a piano was within the purchasing power of a working class immigrant right that in yeah that's right they the, didn't have a steinway grand but they had an, <laughs> an inexpensive mass-produced upright piano probably made in one of the many piano factories in the bronx or manhattan right right yeah i think that's fascinating 
seen some of that um, that terrific uh, scholarship as well. You know, it's great that you you, you mentioned um, uh, the sort of residents themselves and their agency. I think in in you know, we've been sort of talking about this a little bit here, and um, you know, I think you know perhaps you know, I don't want to sort of um, uh, put words in in uh, any of the readers of your book's mouth, but I think you know, looking at the cover, you're passing the book in the bookstore, and architectural history, you might not expect it to be so peopled, right? And I think that's you know really a, um, a strength of of the book is is the um, you know the way you've woven the stories of the residents of the building uh, throughout. Why did you think that was important to do? And well, what that's do you think a key that uh, thing. Of, that that is key to my view on architecture. That buildings, uh, buildings are not just lumps of brick. Um, I like to say that buildings have lives, and I think that that's really important. That 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 you know, it's interesting to say, oh, you know, this is an Italianate building or this is a Greek revival building. But really, ultimately, so what? I mean, uh, it's it's what does the building tell us? What about the people that have used the building, have moved through the building, uh, and how they've done that? That that the building is uh, this this set for lives uh, and for the changing character of the city. Uh, and that's why I think that, that architecture is this entree into this incredibly rich uh, world of, 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 uh, of the culture of, of, of sure. uh, a place. Yeah, no, I think that's, um, that's right. You need to sort of learn something new uh, by studying the intersection of those things. You learn something new about both. Uh, both sort of fields, and I think that's uh, that's really interesting. Buildings have lives, and I've heard you say that before. It's always something that's sort of um, stuck with me. You know, I was thinking about questions to ask you, and you know, we often those of us who have spent many many hours in ninety seven Orchard Street often um, you know talk collectively about either our favorite part of the building or our favorite resident of the building. Do you have a you know something that like stays with you after all these years? You know, something that you think is like. That that piece of the building, that area, et cetera. What is there something like that for you? Was, there are why? two. I mean, I love I love all the apartments and the stories that are are told uh, in them, and I you know, and that is the heart of what the museum is is all about. Uh, especially because they're based on real stories; they're not fabricated stories. But I think to the for me, as an architectural historian, the two most powerful spaces are the rear apartments on the second floor, the one that mm. is still in a, in, in a kind of ruinous condition with nothing in it, that because that was the first apartment I went into. Um, and that that is the apartment that really changed my life uh, and the way I look at the city and at architecture. Uh, and the other one is the building, the apartment next door, which is the apartment where one can read more than in any, in any other apartment, the layers and layers of life in 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 the building, the one with the multiple layers of wallpapers, that the 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 dozen or so different linoleums on the floor, the the all the different kinds of paint from the early blue paint that was that was right. used uh, on through the 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 beige and the less dynamic oil paints uh, and. Um, so that's the that's the the apartment that, for, for me, is an entree into understanding people and how they interacted with the space, which then the museum interprets brilliantly in the in the various reconstructed uh, apartments. I particularly like the Rogashevsky apartment on the on the third floor, uh, in, in in particular because of how crowded it is. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it was nine people that lived there and you go in with a, uh, I often bring my students and I go in with a group and, you know, you, you feel just what it must have been like to live, for nine people to live in this, in this small apartment and, you know, the, all the different ways that they slept and that they used the space. But it was home, too. Right, absolutely. Yeah, for our viewers who may not be familiar, the Rogashevsky family were East European Jewish immigrants who lived in 97 Orchard, roughly from about 1910 uh, through to the end of the life uh, of the building in 1935 as a residence. And, and for some of the uh, the residents beyond that, we know quite a bit from some of their, as you're suggesting, how they use that space, how they lived there, um, uh, from some of the reminiscences of those folks who, who, who called it home. So 
yeah, that's always really, I think, a great moment on tour is to illustrate um, for those folks uh, how many of the family members live there, how they use the space on a daily basis, and, and how they, you know, nonetheless carved out real, um, real lives there. And I think it's really important that we remember that, you know, today with with televisions and all the other uh, technologies mm -hmm. that, that, that we use, social media, with air conditioning, people spend a lot of time in their home. But in the, in the early 20th century, people didn't, the center of people's lives was not necessarily the home. It was the street, the schoolyard. Um, and, and so, you know, you know, they may have come home to their apartment, but they weren't spending all their time every every day and every night there. Right, 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 right. Yeah, that's an important um, point. And you know, incidentally, we have a, a program that we offer called "A Day in the Life," uh, where you get to visit the Rogoshevsky apartment as part of the tour, and then um, you know, sort of explore some of the places they might have visited in the outside neighborhood, mm -hmm. outside the building. So I think that's a you know, kind of an essential. Uh, an essential point to make there. You know, as, as, as you know, and maybe some of our viewers know as well, the Tenement Museum from its very beginning has been a uh, museum that sought not only to explore history, right, the, the sort of specific history of this building, the history of immigration, history of the Lower East Side and of New York City, <clears throat> um, sort of broadly construed, but really, you know, what the um, connections that has to the present, the way that shapes and helps us understand the place we are now, whether it has to do with immigration or identity or community building, et cetera. But, you know, I was curious about your perspective, right? As somebody who's really studied 97 Orchard Street in particular and, and you know, similar buildings uh, for, for decades now, you know, what do you think um, studying a building like 97 Orchard Street has to teach us about our current moment, right? About the kind of, you know, dual, uh, uh, the multiple crises, I should, I should say that we're uh, living through the multiple sort of reckonings, whether that's economic, public health, um, uh, uh, you know, also uh, a, a, a racial reckoning, a reckoning with anti-Black racism uh, and things like this. What do, what do you think we, we can learn from? Well, study? I think that the Tenement Museum can inform us um, on a number of these issues. Um, there have been, uh, you know, public health uh, was, was a very significant issue uh, in these densely overcrowded uh, immigrant neighborhoods. The, the Henry Street settlement was in fa indeed founded as a nurse's um, settlement. And so there was a lot of concern for um, disease and epidemics that, that you know, because it was, the, the, the neighborhood was so crowded, could spread very rapidly. Uh, and so how people were concerned about this and dealt with these issues uh, uh, has some interesting parallels to today. I think the most obvious um, parallel has to do with the rather explosive issue of immigration uh, today. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I find most disturbing, I guess I, have to, I would have to say, is how in reading the anti-immigrant rhetoric of the, especially of the early 20th century, uh, as the um, Italians and Eastern European Jews became the primary immigrants, and there was this enormous rise in, in, in anti-immigrant uh, sentiment, the, a lot of the same arguments that are being used today, anti-immigrant arguments, are, were, were made then. Uh, and you, know, you could almost use some of the diatribes from the early 20th century in the, in the early 21st century. Uh, you know, these, they don't, these immigrants, they don't speak English. They're never going to learn American values. Uh, if they're a foreign invasion. Um, sure. and, 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 you know, and then, of course, you think, well, who are, who are the children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren of these very immigrants that were uh, the subject of this vitriol uh, in the early 20th century? Well, they're all of us. Uh, and, and, and. Uh, we, and, and all of us who have made a contribution to, a, to America. Um, and, and, the, and so this, that's the American story, but sure. it's not something that's recognized by everybody. Right, yeah, no, I think that's really, um, 
you sort of captured that really effectively, you know, uh, to, your, to your sort of point about the public health, I often find myself talking about some of the tenement house laws that you mentioned, whether that's some of the very early ones in 1867 and 1879 and the 1901 law as really being about, um, in a large part about public health, right? About really trying to um, uh, improve the living conditions in these buildings as a, as a sort of public health measure, a lot of them Interestingly, you know, now reflecting on the kind of COVID-19 pandemic uh, had to do with light and air and, you know, even if they didn't sort of have, um, you know, knowledge of uh, disease causation, quote unquote, germ theory in, in a way that we would recognize, right, there was some sort of understanding about light and air being a good, uh, good thing in terms of, of of healthy, healthy people, healthy residents. But there's another overlay to that that is um, a lot less positive. Um, and I, I'm I'm currently writing a book on on the garment district and on the on garment lofts, and I've been looking into um, how the garment industry moved out of tenement apartments um, sure. like the Levin apartment at 97 Orchard Street and moved into lofts. And the every New York State had their office of the factory inspector, and every year they wrote an annual report, and it, they. They discussed the issue of sweatshops and they advocated for the, the abolition of tenement sweatshops. And when I, you know, and I knew this and I assumed it was because the conditions in these sweatshops were so bad that they were, they wanted to improve the lives of the, of the laborers, but that was not at all their concern. Yeah. Their concern was entirely the fact that these dirty immigrants could spread uh, who were who, who they were dirty and diseased and they were making clothing in these apartments and they were often sleeping on the clothing that they were making that that uh, various disease germs would hide in the clothes and and right. plagues could be could be spread all over the country. Now there wasn't any evidence that this had ever happened, but you can sort of understand how how somebody could come up with this public health myth. Um, that that, sure. that this would happen, uh, and ever and they be, the, the factory inspector became one of the leading advocates for immigration restriction. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, you know, I think that's right. Yeah, exactly. I think that's right on. It's you know um, uh, that it's not necessarily these reformers, right, who argued for these laws and these changes weren't necessarily doing so out of altruism or any kind of benevolence and. You know, I think you can also see that in an earlier period, right? It's 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 long been sort of not a coincidence to me that the first tenement house law in 1867, um, you know, comes in the wake of you know one of the last really sort of virulent cholera epidemics uh, and the New York City draft riots, right? And uh, and you know, and and the, as you, as you're familiar, the Citizens Association report, which for our viewers is a kind of study of the quote unquote sort of sanitary condition of the city in 1865, commissioned by city leaders whose concerns even then were, I think, in, in, in the vein of what you're, you're, you're speaking of. Well, we start to get some questions from, uh, from viewers. So I'm gonna um, sort of ask some of those and you know, if, um, can talk about some other things as well. And folks, again, are welcome to submit questions for, for Andrew, uh, but we'll sort of kick things off with this uh, first question, some of which have been contributed by our members. So I want to thank them for that. The first is, um, for three years, I lived in a I-bar tenement on St. Mark's Place, number 19, uh, with a lion's paw tub and tiny sink in the kitchen and a, quote, water closet in the rear. When was the, this building constructed? At the time of construction, did each apartment have its own, quote, water closet? I don't know if you can speak to any of those um, well, I, I, I wouldn't want to commit myself to when it was, right. was built. Um, <laughs> Your best, uh, best, but, um, best educated guess. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, 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 it could have been in the, the, the latter decades of the 19th century, in which case uh, the, 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 there would have been a requirement for water in the apartment. Uh, so the, the, um, the sink and the bathtub, well, it's definitely the sink would have been uh, original um, from the seven, 1870s or 1880s. Um, the bathtub, maybe not. The bathtub probably added in the early 20th century, 
And there would have been probably the requirement when the building was new that there be one toilet for every two families. So the fact that, the that there's a water closet in the apartment means that it could have been added in the early 20th century. Yeah, that's um, interesting. You know, so that there would have been one in every apartment. Could that water closet have been, you know, an early, late 19th century water closet that was later sort of, you know, they kind of broke through a wall to add that into well, that's the, what yeah. I have found, that, that when there were two, uh, uh, two toilets per floor, sometimes they would, they would incorporate the whole toilet right. into the apartment. They'd close the door in the hall and they'd add a, they'd add a, um, a, a door in the apartment. So that's certainly possible. Yeah, I mean, it really goes to uh, what you were saying earlier about <coughs> building owners complying with the law often in, in the least expensive way possible, whether that was because of materials or, or the cost of labor or sort of vice versa. So I think that's really, um, that's really great. Thank you. Uh, you know, similar question, I think you can probably speak to this a little bit more specifically as if, you know, not having to date a building based on, um, you know, a description like that, but uh, this particular um, viewer is asking, is there a way to find out the age of tenement buildings so I can determine if my ancestors actually might have lived in an existing building in the 19th century? You know, a question we get at the museum all the time. How do you, how do you research a building, whether it's one you lived in or one you think your ancestors might have lived in? Um, well, I, you know, that, that, that would take me an hour to give you all the options <laughs> you for teach doing that. class, yeah. Um, but... Um, in, in, um, in, about, in about 1864 or 1865, I've forgotten the exact date, New York City established the Department of Buildings. And so they started keeping records of, of the construction of every building and the date and the architect and the owner. Um, and so it is possible through various records to find that information if the building dates is in Manhattan and dates from after about 1865. Um, so, um, if it's earlier than that, if you wanted to find the date of the building, you would, um, you'd have to perhaps use the tax assessment records because the tax, the assessment will go up when the building is built or sure. look at atlases and see when the building appears, uh, when the footprint of the building appears on atlases. So it's time consuming, but it's fun. You know, then you have that eureka moment when you find the information you want. Right, you're sort of playing detective, and certainly that's the case for 97 Orchard Street, was, which is built just before those kinds of records were, were kept, you know, um, uh, of the year of construction of the architect, etc. Um, uh, and we use and, the tax records, and we use the conveyance yeah, sure. records, to, you know, to help us. Yeah, so you look at all of those, all of those sort of different, different pieces of... Um, of evidence, which is available at uh, places like the New York City Municipal Archives, the New York Public Library, and uh, a lot of these different sort of repositories for, for that kind of information. So that's uh, that's really helpful. Yeah, I mean, you could, you know, all the details, you could, you could spend much more time sort of unpacking. So folks want to know, uh, they can feel free to reach out to the Tenement Museum, and we're happy to uh, provide that kind of advice. Another um, viewer uh, asks, were the tenements in the outer boroughs, like Brooklyn or Queens or the Bronx, et cetera, basically the same as the one at 97 Orchard Street. Yeah, how does, how does I guess, tenement construction sort of differ across the various kind of boroughs? That's a really great question that I can't fully answer. In the 20th century, after Greater New York is established, especially after the 1901 Tenement House Act, which impacted all the boroughs, there is a, a lot of similarity um, to the, the tenement construction. But in the 19th century, it's less so. And mm -hmm. nobody has yet really done a detailed study of the development of the tenement in Brooklyn. Um, in Brooklyn, tenements are often disguised as row houses. Uh, and, and so, you know, I've learned, uh, you, I've learned to, to be able to tell the difference, but a lot of people would not be able to, on first glance sure. to tell the difference they would think that it was uh, a single family row house. You have to look at, is, the, is there a stoop? Uh, where is the door uh, located? Um, and and uh, other, other issues, but 
it's a great topic for, for, for somebody is to really look in greater detail at the development of the tenement in Brooklyn. Because you know, Brooklyn was an independent city. Uh, and so um, it was impacted by the state laws, um, like the tenement laws right. in the 1870s. But then there were there, there, it had its own local regulations. Right, right. I'm sort of thinking, for example, of some of the, um, the housing in, in a place like um, Greenpoint, right, which mm -hmm. is all is probably the sort of what you're referring to here. Absolutely. Kind of wood frame um, uh, uh, that, you know, could reasonably just just to the first glance be, be a single family home, but there are all these kind of telltale uh, kind of right, details. And that's really important because in Manhattan, there were the, the fire district basically mm -hmm. banned wooden construction uh, in, in, by the late 19th century, it was completely banned in Manhattan, but not in Brooklyn. And in fact, when I first got interested in, in New York architecture, uh, I remember uh, in Bushwick, there were uh, block after block after block of wooden tenements, almost all of which mm -hmm. later burned down. Uh, so you really don't, you don't see that, uh, the, the, the frame construction as much as, as you once did. There's still some there, but not as much as there once was. Right, right. Yeah, that's important you have to, to remember that there are different cities for, you know, a significant period of, of, mm -hmm. of the time that we're talking about here and different sort of legal regimes governed what could be could be built at the municipal uh, level. And so you're going to see different, um, uh, different things, different histories there. Another um, question, this I think this is a really interesting one, uh, you know, who built the tenements? 97 North Street is a good example. Uh, were they quote unquote public? housing or uh, privately owned? Well, the tenement construction was entirely private speculative development. And it was done by people that wanted to make a profit. And apparently you could make a very substantial return on investment if you could keep the building fully rented. L largely, the uh, tenements were immigrant investors. Um, at the beginning, small scale investors. Uh, and um, 97 Orchard Street was in the heart of Klein Deutschland. It was a largely German neighborhood. And the developer, Lucas Glockner, was a German tailor, German immigrant tailor. So that kind of typifies that. And the architects also tended to be German in the early period, tended to be German immigrants as well. Probably they didn't speak much English. Some of them may have, have had some architectural training in, in Germany, others probably very little. And they started in America at the bottom rung uh, designing tenements. By the turn of the 20th century, Eastern European Jews had become really involved in speculative real estate development. I mean, you know, this becomes something that's talked about a lot in the early 20th century, how appealing uh, speculative uh, development, especially of, of apartment buildings was to small scale Eastern European mm -hmm. Jewish immigrants, some of whom then became major developers. Every now and then, you know, you'll find something by, let's say, someone in the Tishman family, and then, you know, they're, sure. now they're a major development family. So it's, it's largely an immigrant, uh, Germans, Eastern European Jews, to a lesser extent, um, Italians. Irish immigrants often got involved in row house construction more often mm. than at least in, in my, to my knowledge, than in tenement uh, construction. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, and I think, you know, not only, uh, you know, what we found, of course, in, in um, research about 97 Orchard Street, and this is, you know, really something that's typical, uh, is that the ownership, um, you know, often reflects the ownership, of course, changes hands regardless of who had the building built over the course of its history. And that ownership in terms of who that person is, is often you know, very similar to the, to the tenement. So this idea you know, of the quote unquote absentee landlord uh, who has no um, you know, connection to the, the people who, who are his tenants. You know, it's often, as you were saying, when the Lower East Side is a, is a mostly German immigrant neighborhood known as Little Germany or Klein Deutschland, the owners of 97 Orchard Street are, are German immigrants themselves. <laughs> Perhaps they've been, they've been here, you know, a little bit longer than their tenants, and have been able to, you know, get enough of a quote unquote foothold in the country to to make this investment and 
um, when the neighborhood goes through the process of, of um, you know, six, succession, when the community changes and it becomes mostly East European uh, Jewish immigrants calling the neighborhood and N97 Orchard home, right? The, the Most of the owners are mm -hmm. East European Jewish immigrants who either live in, in the same neighborhood or, you know, in another tenement uh, district often like, you know, uh, East Harlem or something like that. So uh, there, there is some, in the early years of tenement construction in the 1860s and 1870s, the, the, the Lower East Side was transformed from a neighborhood of, of mostly single family uh, row houses, some wood, mostly brick. Uh, many of them had been converted into tenements, so they might have housed six or seven families, but then they were torn down and replaced by buildings that could house 20 or 22 families. Sure. There are examples of old line New York families who owned a row house. Maybe they they lived in that row house at some point in the early 19th century and the family held on to the property. And so there you do have this absentee landlord that some of the old New York families owned a, might have owned a few tenements um, on the Lower East Side. And then most famously, not on the Lower East Side, but Trinity Church, which was uh, among the largest landowners in New York, owned almost uh, everything along the, the West Side waterfront uh, from sure. uh, Tribeca through Greenwich Village. They became one of the, they, they, they got involved in a scandal because they, they were one of the largest slumlords in New York. Um, mm. Uh, so, you know, so there are different ownership patterns, but the Lower East Side uh, and other tenement neighborhoods like Yorkville and Hell's Kitchen, uh, these are mostly immigrant investors. Right, right. And like 97 Orchard Street, the, 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 um, uh, the individual had that building constructed, 97, uh, Lucas Glockner, as you mentioned, right? He lived in the building for, for right. a period of time as well, which I think is is really interesting. Helps and kind what's of really interesting is that he moved from a row house on St. Mark's yes. Place, which had been converted into apartments. So clearly, the, 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 you know, what, what may have seemed substandard to our eyes today, he must have seen right. it as an improvement over living in a rundown old row house that had been converted into a multiple dwelling. Right, right. No, that's a good point. I think even without um, water, running water or, or, or toilets. Yeah, I mean, abs absolutely. I think that's a really important point to make that, you know, even something uh, like a tenement building has a, has a history or tenement buildings sort of writ large as a, as a group in the aggregate, that they're not, you know, a kind of static entity that they have a, a history, um, both in the context of the city and their neighborhoods, et cetera. Um, and that changes over time that the, you know, what living in a tenement building meant uh, was, it was perhaps uh, slightly different in the middle of the 19th century than it might have been in right. the early 20th. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, we don't have any additional questions from viewers. Please please feel free to submit um, some more questions for Andrew. But you know what, what um, one of the most interesting things for me uh, working at the museum, working with you is, you know, the way in which it, um, you know, we've continued to learn about the building over the years, whether that was through um, discovering new things about the historic fabric of the building that sort of taught us something new or made us revisit a an earlier conclusion or found a, a document that we hadn't been aware of. Is there something that really, you know, is the, that um, you find in that particular sense uh, particularly interesting? Um, no, but you know what, I, I can't think of anything specific to that, but something that I've been thinking about a lot um, this summer, um, in, in, indeed, as a lot of us have been thinking about um, issues of Black Americans and, and, and mm -hmm. the interpretation of sites um, within sure. African American history, uh, is how the, 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 the Tenement Museum has, in a sense, been in the forefront of something that I'm, I'm seeing a lot in house museums that are now expanding their interpretation of the black experience. Uh, I'm, I'm going to do a little workshop on, on this with my class um, this year, and I've been talking to a lot of, of museum directors. And one of the things that the Tenement Museum did that 
that I think is the makes it so successful was the decision um, to only tell real stories of real people and importantly to name those people uh, so that we we know the Rogashevsky family and we know the Levin family and and um, we so the Moore family we the, the, these these people are are alive because right. of that and and the this idea of interpreting the lives of the enslaved by giving them names um, that it wasn't just oh they had five slaves working there it was well they had Caleb and John and Maria and Cato were working there and I think that the power of the real people that were were there and the and that they have real names it 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 gives so much more humanity to the, these stories uh and mm -hmm. and i i think that the tenement museum was really a pioneer um in in, in doing that right and, and as you know we're we're working towards ways to in, interpret the black experience in a way that 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 um continues that uh, tradition in a sense and you know curious if you're if any of the um you know, there are any sites you think um, are, are doing that really well today that that uh, folks should look to? Well, I, you know, um, Phillips, uh, Phillips Manor in Westchester um, relatively recently oh, posted sure. a an incredibly sophisticated um, interactive site uh, about mm. uh, the enslaved experience. Uh, and and, uh, you know, they clearly had a, a lot of grant money to do a really good job, uh, and and so it's a real model. And uh, you know, a lot of, but a lot of places don't have that uh, amount of money. But I'm amazed by talking to people at at how um, even even you know the house museums owned by the city that don't have a huge amount of money are are, are really interpreting uh, the 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 lives of of the enslaved individuals to right. give a more fuller picture. Uh, of, of these and you know a lot of these houses are owned by very traditional organizations like the the colonial dames or or the uh or, or similar organizations and they've really are excited about um uh, about e expanding the interpretation of the site uh because of, of course that's what people are interested in um they, there's a small group that that are interested in the furniture maybe or or uh, and you know, or like me, who are interested in the architecture, but even more people are interested in the furniture, the architecture, and the people. Sure. Um, right. And the diversity of the people. Yeah, and I think some of those those um, uh, historic sites that you're mentioning aren't 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 particularly diverse communities where. Um, That's right. You know, absolutely. The, the, the uh, those those stories in some ways need to need to speak. In some way to um, to those communities uh, and the and the issues that they are interested in concerned about. With some more questions that I think would be um, you know interesting. This is one I know we um, uh, we frequently uh, get on on some of our tours. Uh, one of our viewers is asking. I lived in a building on Forsyth Street that was built in 1893? Question mark. So sometime in the late night turn of the 20th century ish area. Uh, why was the floor built with a five degree slope? Yeah, like why do the floors slope in old buildings? Is a question I think many of well, us have. I don't have, think it was have, built with a five degree slope. Right. <laughs> I suspect that it developed in that five degree slope, probably because it was a little bit inadequate structurally. Uh, right. Also, you know, it had a it had a lot of life, uh, and so I the, and, and you know, ninety seven Orchard Street has also had issues uh, with it with the structure. Uh, and and um, that is, you know, tenements were built to the most to the most minimal standards. They didn't they didn't expend a huge amount of money. So these these uh, problems have arisen. Yeah, that's a great. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and um, uh, as you said, we, it's something that we continue, uh, I think, to um, uh, to work work towards in, in our conservation and preservation of 97 Orchard Street. The same uh, viewer asks, um, you know, remember when they visited the museum uh, that the fireplaces were boarded up. Were they ever used? Well, see, that's the big issue for you. For, for <laughs> decades, I've been suggesting that somebody should, should do a study to see how um, much soot 
is in the fireplaces. I do not believe that the fireplaces in the living rooms or the parlors were, were, very, were used very much. I think they're symbolic, they're more symbolic of home. Um, right. And that, you know, the apartments were small enough. So you have to imagine this, the stove in the, in the kitchen, and that would have probably provided any heat that was necessary. Um, so I'm, I'm, I would be surprised to learn, uh, but I would love to learn how often those, uh, what the evidence is that the fireplace has actually worked. Right, yeah, we, 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 we'd love to know that as well. And I think, um, yeah, my thinking is in line with yours. It's really about, um, as we were discussing before, you know, you need a mantle to have a parlor, even if you're a working class immigrant, um, right. because that's what proper parlor making fashion. In middle class America. And as yeah, we talked exactly. about before. Yep, yep. Uh, one more question, uh, you know, this might be the last one if we have time for, uh, and it's, and it's a, a broad one. I don't know if um, uh, you, you can speak to this in, in brief, and it's not an architectural question per se, uh, but what was the eviction process in the 19th century, and were there protections for renters? There were no protections for renters. The first, I could be mistaken about this, but I believe that the first rent control laws were passed in the early 1920s after World War yeah. I because there was a huge housing shortage um, in, in, in New York. There were no protections whatsoever. Uh, there were lots of evictions. Uh, there, there, were, uh, there were even uh, protests against evictions uh, that, that were organized. Uh, right. So um, there, there wasn't a, a lot of protection. On the other hand, there wasn't that much protection for the for the landlords either, and people skipped out on their last month or two of rent uh, very frequently, and they'd move to another building. Right, uh, there so was no, no, no such thing as a written lease for most of the, this period that we're, that's right. we're talking about is essentially a kind of a verbal, uh, a verbal agreement. So that's great, yeah. Um, you know, we have a couple minutes uh, left, so I just wanna have time to, you know, kind of wrap us up and conclude, and I wanna thank you Andrew, for spending the last hour with us. It's always such a pleasure uh, to talk to you and to talk about 97 Orchard Street. I think those of us who spent a lot of time uh, in the building, um, studying the building, could talk about it for, for many hours more. So uh, we want to thank our viewers as well uh, and um, you know, invite you to buy the book. Uh, again, the link is in uh, to the museum's online stores provided in the chat. Um, can follow the link there. Uh, we, of course, want you to stay tuned for future Tenement Museum virtual events. Uh, you can sign up and uh, keep abreast of those uh, for our newsletter on tenement.org. Of course, we hope you'll join us again. Uh, so um, have a good night. Uh, and um, thanks again, Andrew, and we'll hope to see you Thank you. you. It's always, always a pleasure Thanks. to talk about the Tenement Museum. Yes, we'll do it again soon. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.